Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thanks, Sherry, and thank you, Global Patties. You know, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor support, and we know you'd rather we get right to talking about beekeeping. However, our great sponsors are critical to help making all of this happen. From the transcripts, the hosting fees, the software, the hardware, the microphones, the subscriptions, the recorders, they enable each episode. So with that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. We're really happy you're here. Before we get started, just a quick reminder to subscribe or follow Beekeeping Today podcast and give us a five-star rating. It really does help. Also, we are now adding complete transcripts of each episode on the website after the show notes. Check them out. You can also leave questions and comments online under each show. You can leave a comment, ask a question, reply to a question, ours or our listeners. Click on leave a comment at the top of the episode's show notes to join the discussion. Have you listened to an episode and thought, that person sounds really interesting? and I'd like to know more about them. Well, now you can. Each episode links to a guest profile. Each profile has a guest photo, bio, contact information, including Instagram and Twitter details if they have them. Check it out. And finally, share the podcast with your beekeeping friends, email them links, or mention it at your next beekeeper meeting. Hey, everybody. Thanks again for joining us. A little treat today. Sitting here in the Beekeeping Today studios is Kim Flottam. Hey, Kim, welcome to the opening of Beekeeping Today podcast. Well, it's good to be here again. I uh, like Thursday mornings a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, you know, there's been a lot of good news and uh, for beekeepers to start off the year. First of all, what we had on the podcast, uh, it's making the rounds, especially in, uh, in all the national media, is the, the vaccine for American fowl brood. That's, that is big news. That's the biggest. Well, let me put it this way. That news has gotten more attention than anything you can possibly <laughs> believe. Uh, back a few years ago when colony collapse disorder, when that phrase became popular, that got a lot of attention. But a negative but word. It, well, yeah. But but it got a lot of attention in terms of, from a beekeeper's perspective, bad, and from the rest of the world looking at what beekeepers were going through, it was even worse. I mean, yeah. we're all going to starve, according to what was going on then. <laughs> but uh, the, folks, the folks that have come up with this vaccine for American fall brood, uh, I have seen more attention to that particular story published in more countries and in more media yeah. than anything that I've seen in bees in 50 years. Yeah, I, it, just this morning I heard something on NPR about uh, coming up on a special science report, a new vaccine for honeybees. So yep. it's uh, making its round. So I, I would encourage our listeners to take a listen to our discussion with Dr. Keith Delaplane. Uh, from the first of this month of January to kind of refresh uh, yourself on the vaccine for honeybees. And so that way you can talk to your friends and neighbors and anybody else about, hey, what's going on about that vaccine for honeybees? How do they get that needle in those tiny little legs? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the good thing about talking to Keith on this is that he doesn't put a lot of hyperbole in it. That's right. I mean, he's just, he's doing the, it's his people and his bees that the research is being done on. He's working with them, but the researchers there come to his lab and work with his people and, and he's right on top of looking at the results. And so 
I've read a lot of these stories, and and you'd think this stuff was going to save the world from climate change <laughs> or something. But um, Keith, Keith got his both feet on the ground on this, and it was um, it was good to get it from someone who 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 isn't excited but fact based. Yeah. Well, one of the other hot topics in the news these days, and starting to make rounds, is is discussions about tropa labs and. Um, you know, that's that's another mite that's on the horizon for those of us in the States. And uh, but a reality for other beekeepers in Southeast Asia. That's a nasty one. You remember what the last time we had Sammy on? Yep. Uh, he was talking. He was over there doing the research on that on that particular creature. And he pretty much shared with us what they're doing over there for that. And a lot of it doesn't involve poison. Yeah, uh, what well, wasn't it? A lot of it was using formic acid, wasn't it? Well, and and brood break. The one thing I want to I want to mention also, Jeff, is uh, you know there's been a lot of there's been a lot of attention to uh, I'm going to use this term loosely climate change and beekeeping. Mm-hmm. What what is the what, what's going to happen to bees and beekeeping and beekeepers as as the weather we experience every day begins to evolve towards perhaps a warmer, uh, a warmer climate, and is it going to affect bees and beekeepers and beekeeping? I'm I'm starting. I've been doing. I got six months of research sitting here, uh, following this: the the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the and the not so bad. And uh, on our webpage, we get a blog. And uh, there'll be contribu- regular contributions to that blog, looking at every aspect of what what is going on, and in all in every part of the the world, you know, including mo- all of the states. So, um, if you're wondering what's going to be down the road two, three, five years from now, uh, t- tune in and, and check this out because uh, there's some good things going on, and there's some things that are going to be really, really bad if it doesn't change. Mm. All right, Kim. Well, let's get on with our discussion with Marina. But first, a quick word from our friends at Strong Microbials. Hey, beekeepers! Many times during the year, honeybees encounter scarcity of floral sources. As good beekeepers, we feed our bees artificial diets of protein and carbohydrates to keep them going during those stressful times. What is missing, though, are key components the good microbes necessary for a bee to digest the food and convert it into metabolic energy. Only Super DFM Honeybee by Strong Microbials can provide the necessary microbes to optimally convert the artificial diet into energy necessary for improving longevity, reproduction, immunity, and much more. Super DFM Honeybee is an all-natural probiotic supplement for your honeybees. Find it at strongmicrobials.com or at fine bee supply stores everywhere. And while you're at the Strong Microbial site, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, their regular newsletter full of interesting beekeeping facts and product updates. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. Sitting across the virtual Zoom table right now is Marina Marchese. Marina, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you again, Marina. It's been quite a while. And I guess to get started with this, well, first off, like I said, it's good seeing you again. I know you've been busy, and it looks like you're getting busier. But let's back up a half a step for the people who haven't listened to you before and give us a real brief background of the American Honey Tasting Society and your role in it and what you've been up to lately. So yeah, great to see you, Kim and Jeff. Thanks for having me back. So basically, the American Honey Tasting Society is an organization that I started, and it's educational based on, you know, teaching beekeepers and culinary professionals about honey and basically to teach them how to talk about it, how to taste it. And we also teach a little bit about defects and what constitutes good quality honey. So this is something that I started after I did my training in Italy. So there are those of you who don't know, there's a honey school in Italy that I went to. And I wrote a little bit about it in Bee Culture Magazine a few years back. And we've talked about it before. But basically, we're teaching beekeepers how to produce a better product and elevate honey. 
Okay, that's part of teaching beekeepers how to produce a better product. But the connoisseur part of this, it sounds to me, and I'm guessing people are thinking it's much like being a wine connoisseur. What's good and what's not or why? So, yeah, early on as a new beekeeper, I was very fascinated with all of the different varietals of honey, all of the different botanical sources. And I was searching for a database as a new beekeeper to help me to understand my honey and all the honey that I was collecting from all the different beekeepers that I was meeting and, you know, honey gifts and just traveling. And, you know, like most beekeepers, I had a collection of honey and I was just so fascinated with the colors and the flavors. And I I was looking for some kind of a database that would help me to understand, well, if my bees are visiting clover, my honey should look and smell and taste a certain way, or, you know, my bees are working on buckwheat or linden. And there really was no information to help a new beekeeper. So, you know, I basically stumbled upon this program in Italy where they basically treat honey like a fine wine. And anybody who has you know, been to a wine tasting or read about wine and enjoys drinking wine or even any kind of artisan food, chocolate or olive oil, they realize that there's a whole, you know, program dedicated to studying and talking and tasting wine. And Italy had really developed this kind of similar program. So we see that honey parallels wine in all of those different ways where the environment is going to change the sensory characteristics. Just to bring listeners up to date, you and I put our heads together back here a few years ago and produced a book called The Honey Connoisseur. And your role in it was defining how honey tasted. And you came up with your honey tasting wheel, which is in that book. My contribution was mostly in terms of the plants that you were looking at, the bees were visiting. So I kind of took care of the source and you took care of the end product. The part that I enjoyed of that the most certainly was the fact that you just mentioned if I'm tasting clover honey, it should look and taste like this. But if I plant clover in Ohio and I plant clover in in California and I plant clover in New England where the soil is very acidic or the soil is very basic, the clover honey in the New England may be and probably is going to be somewhat, it may be significantly different than the clover honey from the same plant collected in the Midwest or on the West Coast. So that's a nice little bit of being a connoisseur. Can you explain that? Yes. So definitely I was so honored to work with you and have you provide all of the information on the botanical sources that bees are making honey from. I think it's a really very important part of the whole picture. So you know, we really planted the seeds with that book of getting people to really look at honey in a different way, to really elevate it and to have them sort of taste it and to really pay attention that it will change depending upon the botanical source and where that botanical source is growing. So that was really an exciting project. And I think people are still buying the book and and there's still some readers that contact me that have just stumbled upon the book. And they're very excited about this idea about tasting honey and trying to pick out the flavors and the smells and comparing the honeys that they collect because beekeepers basically collect honey. Everybody has some kind of a honey collection. So it's kind of trying to plant the seeds to make sense of, you know, your honey and all of these botanical sources that are available for bees. It adds another dimension to being a beekeeper. To me, it's one that I really enjoy. It's not very hard and it tastes good. Let's put it that way. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) You know, now we're starting to see beekeepers become very interested in honey more as an artist in food rather than sort of a commodity of beekeeping. And I think there's an excitement that's happening now about, you know, exploring all of these flavors and all these botanical sources and where they come from. And even not only just in the U.S., but around the world, we're seeing that there's so many different kinds of honeys with different 
profiles and there's always a mixture, you know, it's, it may never be a pure single origin, honey. There can be a little bit of something else in it. That brings up another question. And that question is, have you seen the new advertisements for the honey that's made without bees? It's an enzyme produced with sugar syrup. I'm not exactly sure of the process. Have you been able, A, to taste it? And if you have, what does it taste like? I actually, yes, I have heard about them. There's a few different, and they contacted me to work with them, but I didn't really have time in my schedule, but I haven't tasted it. And I am curious. I don't know the recipe. I don't know the secret behind what their product is. I know there are some, quite a few different ones on the market, but there's one now that I've seen, you know, uh, in the, in the news all the time, but it's on my bucket list of something to taste. I'm going to be interested in getting some of that also. And the other half of that question then, of course, is the recent, well, not too recent, ongoing problems with contaminated, adulterated honey. Most of it's foreign. Can you tell when you're tasting an adulterated honey? Oh, do I have to, do I have to tell the <laughs> truth? <laughs> I will tell you, I'm honest. You know, I, I, I'm just going to say a lot of times when I taste honey that's generally in a plastic bottle that has been imported, I do taste the defect that we call metallic. And it tastes, at, you know, like iron, rusty metal. And it very well could be that honey that is shipped in those metal drums can come in contact with rust or or something, you know, rusty or the or the the tools, you know, how it's being harvested. I do find that the metallic note of defect is pretty apparent across the board. And I do, you know, when I'm ever at a coffee shop and you know they have the little fixing bar with the milk and the sugar and all the honey, there's always a honey bottle there. I'm curious, so I go and taste it. And usually those are the ones that have that kind of off flavor that for me personally, it's very off-putting. But I don't know if the consumer really realizes that. But I could tell you that I talk to a lot of people about honey and every once in a while, I come across somebody that says, I do not like honey. I don't want to taste it. And if I'm near some honey, you know, some good quality honey, beekeeper honey, and I let them taste it, nine out of 10 times, they'll say, their face will light up and they'll say, wow, that's really good. I never, I never knew I liked honey. And I, and my next question to them is, well, what kind of honey had you tasted in the past that you didn't like? And their answer is always the same. Oh, I got it in the grocery store, you know, in the big box store. And it was not really, you know, beekeepers, you know, homemade honey. But then sometimes once in a blue moon, I'll come across somebody that they won't even taste the honey. They say, I don't like honey. I don't want to taste it. And they don't even really, they just for some reason don't like honey. And I, and I haven't figured that out, but it's pretty easy to convert people into honey lovers if you can get them the real thing, like a good quality, fresh product. Being a honey connoisseur, and we're talking about taste now, is taste an inherent ability or is it a learned trait? I've always been told or I've always thought I have a terrible palate. I can't taste differences. And other people say, oh, man, you can't taste that. And I said, no, I can't. Is taste learned or is it genetic? I think it's a little bit of both. Generally, you can learn to become a good taster. And the, the real secret behind being a good taster is having some kind of training where, you know, somebody's working with you, which we do in the class. We give you different kind of smell exercises. But the secret really to being a good taster, and I'm telling you my secret, is it's the memory. It's having a good memory. So if I blindfolded you and I gave you an apple and a banana and you took a bite of it and you didn't see them, I think you would know the difference between an apple and a banana. And basically it's it's your memory. You've eaten a banana, you've eaten an apple a thousand times. You remember what the smell is. You remember what the texture is when you chew it, the sound of the crunchy apple, whereas a banana is more, you know, soft and mushy. So having a good memory and developing that through training, through sensory training, through these classes that we're doing can help you to become a better taster. 
And of course, you know, you're working against yourself, you you know, whatever your baseline is, you can always improve with what you have. And, and of course, I think there's certain people that are a little bit better, a little sharper. Obviously, having a stuffy nose or a cold makes it very difficult, you know, but be able to identify different kinds of smells and flavors, having allergies like I do myself. I have to really watch that. It's, it's, it makes it tough sometimes, but it's really developing your memory. I'll hold out hope that my palate will improve from the years of growing up in the Midwest with overcooked beef and potatoes for dinner every day. (laughs) That's a challenge. I think if you wanted to work with, you know, me or if you wanted to do the class, you could definitely improve. And what's the benefit not only of improving and sharpening your senses is once you start being able to, you know, identify different flavors, you start to become a better cook because you start picking out different flavors and ingredients and mixing them together. Of course, you're going to be mixing different honeys. You may have a couple of different honeys that you want to mix with different foods or pair with cheeses. So you enjoy your food better too, because you're tasting and really savoring and enjoying it. Well, there's hope. Let's take this quick break for a word from one of our sponsors. Hey, has winter's chill and weather forced you inside? Well, did you know that Better Bee offers winter classes you can take from the comfort of your own home? Our classes are taught by Dr. David Peck and Eastern Apicultural Society Master Beekeeper Anne Fry. Our classes range from basic courses on essentials of beekeeping all the way up to specifics on planning for the seasons ahead and for your success. Visit betterbee.com forward slash classes to view all of our upcoming learning opportunities. Well, Jeff, two things. One is, even if you have an untrained palate like I do, getting a hold of the tasting wheel that is in Marina's book, you'll look at all the different flavors that start. You know, there's metallic and acid, and there's all sorts of them. And then you go, oh, yeah, okay, I can taste that. And then you break it down a little bit further and a little bit further, and you end up with a flavor. The other part of that equation is that I wonder if the honey is produced by those people who are feeding bananas to their bees is going to be changed. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, there was there was a honey on one of the judging panels that I was on and the beekeeper was feeding the bees chocolate sugar water hoping to get chocolate honey and I don't think it came out very well. I that might be bee abuse. <laughs> <laughs> Marina, you talk about teaching people and I know that you just returned from a teaching experience. Tell us a little bit about that. So yeah, I just came back from Bologna, Italy, where I studied, and and it's the city where the Beekeeping Institute is located in Italy, and that's where they really started and continue doing these honey educational classes. So I was honored to be invited to co-teach with two of my teachers there, Raffaele Dal Olio and John Luigi Marquezan, who were my, some of my first teachers and some of the best honey tasters in the world. They were doing an English speaking class. So now in Italy, they're doing English language, I should say, classes. And I was invited to sort of co teach with them for five days. And it was a great experience for me to meet all of the students coming from around the world. I mean, literally, people came from. Asia, Saudi Arabia, we had London, we had South Africa, we had two people from the US. So we have two new honey tasters on our growing list here in the US. And it was really great an experience for me to spend time with everybody and to teach and to learn and to meet and to hear about their beekeeping practices. And they, of course, brought samples of their honey from their country or from their home apiary. So we got to taste different honeys of their production. I was really just very honored to be part of that. And that class was just on honey tasting. Yeah. So it's four days of basically we teach 
the students how to sharpen their senses through various sensory exercises. So we have a lot of taste and smell exercises that are sort of like self-challenging. And this basically serves to help you with your memory, but also sharpen your senses and to help you identify. So for example, we have little cups with smells in them. So there might be cups with rosemary in it or cinnamon or you know, lemons. And basically the challenge is to smell them and to identify them and to describe them. So this helps you to kind of really sharpen up your senses. And then we learn the process of tasting honey, how to look, smell, and then taste, and then describe all of those sensory characteristics, how to write notes about the honey. And also we learn and taste different defects for them to really become aware of different things that can happen to honey along the process of, you know, harvesting, extracting, bottling, storing honey. So it's a, it's a very well-rounded program. It's not just really tasting. It's, it's really a whole education around honey and handling honey and what you're looking for. Are there different levels of connoisseurs or the sommeliers like they do in wine? Yeah, there's, well, there's basically different levels of the class. So the first class, which we just did in Bologna, was a four day. Four, well, it's a four or five day. So that's the first class. And those students and, and everybody, after they take that first class, they're so excited. They want to take the second level class. So you're required to wait four months and then you can apply to take the second level class, which must be taken in Bologna, Italy, or because that's the, you know, the center where they have the institute. So they'll take the second level and that's called kind of a refresher. And then there's a third class that you can take, which is also three days and it must also be taken in Bologna, Italy. And after the class, the third class, there's an exam, there's an oral and a written exam, believe it or not, honey, really honey school. And what the challenge is for the um, oral exam is when you're there, you're learning 18 different honeys from 18 different botanical sources. So in that period of time that you're taking these classes, you really need to be studying and staying, you know, keeping your senses sharp and so basically you have to blind taste and smell 18 honeys and then identify them. And it sounds crazy, but you know, look, we do it with wine and olive oil and chocolate and tea, you know, practicing and, and learning how to describe them and identifying them. You can do it. So you, you have this test and, you know, after you pass the test, if you don't pass, I guess you can take it again in a couple of months. But if you pass the test, then you can actually make an application to join the registers. So in Italy, they have a register, which is essentially a list of people who have taken the classes, passed the final exam, and you become part of this group of people that are honey sensory experts trained in Italy. And once you become a member of that, then you're required to teach and stay involved with honey because it's like a bicycle. If you don't practice and you don't continue being engaged, practicing your senses and learning about honey, you know, you could really get very rusty very quickly. So you're required to maintain your membership with the register by teaching different classes, you know, participating in their national honey judging programs. They have refresher courses online, in person. So it's a little bit of work to stay current with your membership, but I enjoy it because I like to connect back with my roots and, and the people that, you know, are doing all of this amazing work. When you started talking about the oral exam, and I was thinking you have to answer a lot of questions before a panel, but you literally meant oral exam where you're tasting yeah. the different things. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it was a mental shift. If you heard a noise, that was my brain doing a shift in, <laughs> in the middle of what you're talking. But it's also a big commitment. I mean, if a person wants to do this and become a honey connoisseur or the sommelier or the official taster, the time commitment and travel to Italy, you know, you have to really want to do it. Exactly. And it is a commitment to do it. 
And I think if you're interested in this and you take the first class, the first level, basically in the first level, you learn everything. Then it's really up to you to continue studying and practicing and, you know, working on your own. If you really feel strongly that you want to continue to do this, and I I can certainly see why people would like to do that, especially if they have their own honey business, it really helps with marketing and they can do their own honey tastings with their customers and and they can do them at their apiary and their honey house. They can really, you know, get out there and start educating the public. But honestly, the, the problem is, is that if you do all of this work and this commitment, There's really no jobs as a honey sommelier. I mean, I do a lot of teaching. I do sometimes taste honey for beekeepers. They'll ask me to taste honey and I'm happy to do that. And I will provide them with my personal tasting notes, you know, whatever I taste, floral, earthy, woody. And really, I want to help them because it helps them to market their honey. And it helps to market good quality beekeepers, honey produced in the U.S. And hopefully by educating the beekeeper, they're going to educate the customer. And ultimately, the customer, the consumer is going to make a better choice and start becoming aware that there's a big difference between beekeepers, honey and maybe commercial imported honey. So there's really not a lot of work outside of teaching, but certainly beekeepers can be teaching at their own aviary. I can also see where it would prove valuable in tasting your own honey to see if you had screwed it up. You know, you'd overheated it or (laughs) a lot of people, you just take a taste honey and you move on. And if you're looking at it closely like you do, you may pick up some fault that you can learn from and avoid in the future. You said you teach people. How can I in the United States take a class like this? I will be doing classes again with Atlas Obscura online. And we're trying to get together to do a class, a four-day class here in Connecticut again with one of the experts from Italy. So there's a lot of logistics and planning, but That's something that will be announced in the American Honey Tasting Society newsletter. And also it'll be on social media. It'll be on the website. So when we can get that together with travel and and everything, that will be announced. But otherwise, most people are going to Italy right now or they're doing some of the online classes that I'm teaching. Would that class in Connecticut count for the first trip to Italy? Yes, that's a great question. And it would be because that we would have one of the experts here from Italy overseeing everything. And also they would allow that the students that come to these classes and we've done we've done them before COVID where the students came here. We actually had students from all over the world. We had quite a few from the U.S. and Canada. But those students, we did 25 and 25 in groups, and we were able to give them the first level certification. And now a good handful of them have gone to Italy to finish their second level. But things got slowed down from COVID. And also, there's a limit because they're not doing most of the classes they're doing are not in English language. So it's been a little bit slow for people to get full certification. You know, honestly, this whole program is very, very new. Well, I shouldn't say it's new. It's been going on in Italy for 40 years. It's just now that it's being, you know, spread through the English language community of beekeepers. So now they're shifting and trying to do more and more classes to accommodate English language speakers around the world. So in case anybody wanted to know, you had one of the experts and it was Raphael with you the last time you were on the show back in October of 2020s. Folks want to look at that show. It'll be linked in the show notes. Yes, he was one of my very first teachers. And going back to what you were saying, Kim, about, you know, beekeepers figuring out if they screwed up their honey, I have learned a tremendous amount with my own honey. And I had just the handling now and and learning about what I'm looking at. I've learned a tremendous amount about crystallization and structure. I've learned a lot about water content. I had a a situation where my bees had produced honey on deep frames, I should say, which I don't usually harvest, but I had a couple of beautiful 
<laughs> perfectly capped honey on these deep frames. And of course, the deep frames had the metal support wires. Well, I took about four or five frames off of the hive because I really wanted this honey. And, you know, there was just bursting with honey. So I was able to take a few and I stored them in a container, one of those seal tight plastic containers, you know, those bins. By the time I got around to harvesting the honey, I realized that all of it tasted like metallic because it had been sitting in contact with those metal support pins for about five months. So I pretty much spoiled all that honey. And that was a lesson learned about, you know, harvesting your honey quickly or not harvesting it with those metal support wires. So I've learned a lot and, you know, I'm always learning, you know, it never ends. There's always something else to learn. There's always a new honey to taste, a new flower to discover. I'm guessing that many of the common problems that beekeepers have, like honey with too much moisture, I mean, I can measure it with a machine and it's going to give me 22% or whatever. But can you tell honey that has too much moisture just by the taste? Well, you could, you know, roll it around the glass and you could make sort of a ballpark judgment if it's too runny or if it's, you know, low low moisture, very viscous. I mean, just by tasting it, I mean, I think you would know if it was very runny. So, yeah, you you know, it's you, you can't really determine what that percentage of water is. But I think, you know, if it's overly runny, you're going to notice that, you know, by rolling the container around, you could feel it. It's the stuff that's not overly runny, but still too high in moisture. I'm wondering if you get a flavor there. It, yeah, it's, it's not going to affect the flavor. It's more about the texture and the viscosity. So, And using too much smoke, I'm going to guess, is also going to be. Yeah, so that's one of the things we find, you know, newer beekeepers might be a little timid working with their bees and, and over smoke or varroa treatments that have those aromatic substance like thyme and eucalyptus and camphor. Sometimes that ends up residual in the honey. So, you know, having bees make honey on old wax, you know, dirty old brown, black wax, not so appealing. <laughs> now, now you're speaking to Kim because he's an anti-old comb guy, so. <laughs> yeah, you got to have that new white comb. It makes a big difference. Along these lines, one of the discussions you always hear beekeeper meetings come up somewhere is the quality of honey difference between fresh cut comb honey versus extracted honey or spun honey or however you want to say it. As a honey taster, can you taste the difference between honey that you taste when you bite into a piece of comb honey versus the honey that's been extracted in in a bottle? The argument is the honey that's extracted picks up contaminants that affects the honey. So, yeah. So honey in the comb, you know, it does have like, you know, the full flavor if you just bite into it and it, it just really has, you know, a very you know, the the aromatics are very, very high. But, you know, so when you're talking about extracted honey and that's in a bottle, are you talking about, you know, one day old or or a year old? Because I think, you know, you can tell the difference between honey that's two years old compared to honey that's freshly extracted. Because the aromatics, you know, they dissipate the, the volatile compounds, you know, and then as honey ages, the color gets darker. And that kind of affects it visually. If you, if you know what you're looking at, especially if you're looking at like a black locust, acacia honey, you know, you're looking for that very light, light honey. After a couple of years, you definitely see that it gets a little bit darker or if it's mixed with another botanical source. But I don't think you can really tell the difference between in the comb and like extracted the same day in a jar. But over over months, years, you can tell the difference. It it really it really loses flavor and becomes sweeter. You know, you're just getting mostly the sweet or the sour, the bitter. If I was going to develop a collection of tastes, 10 or 12 different kinds of honey, would freezing them preserve the initial 
aromatics and flavor and all of that so that I could go to the freezer and pick up this bottle and say, I know what this is and I know what it should taste like and it does because it's frozen or is freezing not slow down that degradation? Yeah, so I do freeze honey. I I have some certain samples that I like to keep on hand. I use them basically for teaching. So if I get, you know, somebody gives me or I get a great, you know, honey sample, I freeze them and I freeze them because I'm saving them for for teaching samples mostly. Or if I want to go back and I want to like revisit that particular botanical source. So I freeze them in co- in glass jars with a lid tight. But I can tell you that after about two years, three years, even if that honey is in the refrigerator, I should say I refrigerate them, not freeze them. Even after a couple of years in the refrigerator with the lid tight, they get freezer burn. Do you know that that flavor when bread or, or something has been in the freezer for too long? It absorbs whatever the smells are in the refrigerator and it just taints it for me. So I do freeze and uh, refrigerate honey samples, but I try to use them within a year or two. And it does keep them stable. So if they, they're liquid, they become crystallized. And when they're completely crystallized really nicely, homogeneously, that's a very stable state for the honey. So it'll stay nice and it won't ferment. But after a couple of years, I mean, there's really no good way to keep honey for a very long time. You know, it really has to be consumed fresh because it deteriorates on so many different levels over time. So precious and so rare, right? <laughs> Unlike those wines that, you know, improve with age, honey doesn't, apparently. It doesn't improve with age. Yeah, it's not like wine. It does not better. I mean, days, weeks, months, it changes. You know, you may not know that, but if, like I said, if you have your little collection of honeys on the shelf, you might see, you know, eventually they crystallize, the liquid honey crystallizes, and then it's nice and solid. And then over a couple of weeks and months, you're going to start to see separation like layers. You get that that white, that, that liquid layer on the top where the glucose starts to separate from the water because glucose is less soluble than the fructose. So you start to see like a liquid layer on the top of the solid and that liquid layer gets larger and larger. At that point, that water content of that liquid layer is really high and then your honey's going to start to ferment. So you've seen that before, right? Where there's like a liquid layer on top and it separates. Never in my honey, (laughs) Marina. Um, (laughs) We all have separated honey at some point of our (laughs) life. Yeah, it doesn't get better with age. There's just no way around it. So eat your honey, eat your best honey, share it, cook with it. There you go. Well, this has been fascinating. I look forward to following your classes this coming year to see what you're going to be up to. I encourage people to watch your webpage and your social media so that if they're interested, they can get in touch with you. What have we missed? What have we missed? What have we missed? It's all going to be on social media. There you <laughs> Anything go. talk about. I mean, that's the world we live in, right? Yes. So you want, yes. you want to check in, you want to see what people are doing. I'm trying my best to, to post on social media, keep websites updated. So yeah, it'll be in the news. It'll be virtual. We'll have your links and contact information in the show notes. So if people want to find out any more about the American uh, Honey Tasting Society and anything you're doing in books, they know where to go. Check the show notes. Exactly. Okay. Thanks, Marina. This has been fun. Welcome back. Yeah, thank you, Kim. And great to see you again. And Jeff. Thank you. It's always good having Marina on the show. I was joking about my palate being horrible, and and it is true. I'm trying to improve it. I mean, I came from a family who thought fancy ketchup was hot. I did not grow up with a very refined palate. So this is all very interesting and educational. I'm glad Marina was on the show. Yeah, I had sort of the same background in diet growing up, but uh, 
When I was living in Connecticut, I got to know Marina. And then after being editor of Bee Culture, we got to put our heads together and did that book. And I learned a lot of tasting and honeys and all of the things involved. And uh, it definitely was an eye-opening experience. And it was fun. She's fun to work with. I think if you start as a beekeeper, and this is what I've learned, and hopefully it's the same for other beekeepers, the more you taste and the more you learn about tasting, what you brought up about tasting problems in the honey will only serve you well as a beekeeper. So if it's more than just, yeah, it's honey, you can actually taste whether or not the knife was too hot, or you can actually taste the variances between blooms or floral sources. It makes you a better beekeeper and, and more aware of what your bees are doing. Absolutely. And if you take a look at the book, The Honey Connoisseur, Marina's tasting wheel is in there. And take one look at that tasting wheel and you, you look at it, there's like 250 flavors, that many or more flavors that honey can have, depending on, and the word is terrar. It's where if I grow alfalfa in Ohio and alfalfa in Connecticut, the honey from alfalfa is going to taste a little bit different because of the acidity of the soil and the environment that it's growing. So you have to learn those differences. So when you say alfalfa honey, alfalfa from where? When you're good, she can do this. Even if you're not that good, at least you can tell it's alfalfa and you can tell if it's harvested right, if it was processed right, bottled right, and stored right. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at globalpatties.com. Thanks to Strong Microbials for their support of this podcast. Check out their probiotic line at strongmicrobials.com. We want to thank Better Bee for their longtime support. Check out all their great beekeeping supplies at betterbee.com. Thanks to Northern Bee Books for their support of Bee Books Old New with Kim Flodham. Check out all of their books at northernbeebooks.co.uk. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on the show. Feel free to leave us comments and questions at leave a comment section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody.